welcome to the Career Coffee Chat Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Urban, Certified Career Strategist and Executive Coach, removing career roadblocks so you can achieve more impact, influence, and income. Welcome to Career Coffee Chat Live. I'm your host, Aaron Urban. I'm an Executive Career Accelerator Coach, and what I do is I help driven, emerging, and evolving leaders like yourself remove remote blocks so you can achieve or impact income and influence. And today we'll be talking about that influence part of developing your career, advancing yourself, promoting yourself, moving up the ladder, or just leveraging that inner brilliance. It's interesting this morning I posted about inner brilliance and how most of us don't realize how much untapped potential we have inside of ourselves. And when it comes to influence, it's not just for those people who are quote unquote extroverts and lives of the party and the known people and the influencers. No, not at all. In fact, anyone can leverage their influence to not only better their lives and their careers, but grow themselves as an individual and tap into that inner brilliance. And today to help us tap into the inner brilliance, we have a wonderful guest that I am thrilled to have on the show. Now, as you hop on the show, I want to make sure that I can welcome you. Come on in, join us, pull up a chair, have be a part of the conversation. Now, also, I bet you would be interested to know that not only is influence available to everyone, and regardless if you work on your personality type, influence is the number one definitive marker of success. Now, Ed Crow, who is our exceptional guest this morning, who is a talent transformation expert for individuals and businesses looking to achieve massive growth, will be sharing exactly how to tap into that success element of influence. Now, Ed has helped hundreds of clients, including Fortune 500 companies, achieve talent and culture transformations. And you're here joining this morning to achieve a transformation too. Now, whether you are tuning in now or to the podcast later, please say hi, say where you're from, and don't be shy, ask your questions. Whether it's now or watching the replay later, we will see your comments and we will get to you. Or feel free to direct message us. Now, Ed is wonderful. I'm just so excited to have him on the show today. So I'd love to welcome Ed to the show. Hi, Ed. Hey, Aaron. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Good I'm to really be excited here. to talk about influence because I think a lot of people misunderstand what it is, what it does, how they can tap into it. And I know for a fact there are millions of people who feel like they have absolutely no influence at all. Yeah. And that's not true, is it? Not at all. In fact, I was doing some digging in preparation for our call, and I found that most sociologists agree that the average person, so just folks like you and me and and the folks tuning in, influence about 15,000 people in our lifetime. So you start thinking about those kinds of numbers, and people say, no way, Ed, I don't even know 15,000 people. (laughs) And I say, no one says you have to know them, right? Your influence could start like that flower seed and and it's one seed and it impacts one person. And that person goes on and blossoms and develops pollen and creates more seeds and they hit more people and so on. That's influence. It's that water rushing downhill kind of thing. And absolutely, we've all got the potential in us to influence 15,000 people over the course of our lifetimes. And, and it's to me, that's an awesome responsibility, actually. It is. It is. And it's interesting. We think of influence as something, I don't know, it's like the networking. Like mm-hmm. network is a thing, and if you do, it's a thing. No, it's really a part of your life, if you yeah. do it correctly. The same thing with influence. You know, influence is a thing. It's this, it's this they, they elevate the level of significance around influence. And mm-hmm. when anyone elevates the level of significance about anything, it becomes, it feels less obtainable. It feels like it's out there when really it's right here with you every day. Yeah. And one of the reasons sociologists propose that individuals, even extremely introverted individuals who don't like to leave their home and the <laughs> pandemic was a wonderful time, they never left, they were great. Woo. <laughs> even those individuals who don't like to go out in public mm-hmm. influence over 15,000 people in their lifetime is because of those un, unlooked for moments. Mm-hmm. I'll give you an example. I was in the grocery store one day. This was pre-pandemic. 
I still go to the grocery store, by the way. But. <laughs> good, good. We don't want you going hungry. <laughs> I, do, I do go to the grocery store, but my husband, bless him, has helped me tremendously. He's been like, I'll go to the grocery store. There I'm you like, go. Yay. I love my husband. He's wonderful. Anyway, so I was in the grocery store and watching this gentleman on the phone, you know, how it is Bluetooth, things are on, we're doing his groceries and talking to whomever's on the other end. And of course, everybody else is learning a lot about him that probably sure. don't want to know. And he gets to the cashier and he's still talking to someone else. He's not paying attention to the cashier. The cashier is furniture. And of course, you can see the expression, right, on the cashier's face. Flip, what a jerk. Flip. Mm-hmm. I'm, attention. Mm-hmm. Blip, I'm just furniture blip it's just that blip, yeah. you know and i get up there he, he checks out goes off and does whatever i mean i have decided that i'm glad i'm not dating anymore because that's what he was talking about i was like oh gosh i'm, <laughs> I'm married to a wonderful man anyway so i get up there and i, I look at the cashier and go how are you how are you doing did you have a good weekend and all of a sudden she lights up yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. that's influence Absolutely, it is. It doesn't have to be this thing. Nope. Nope. <laughs> and what got you into focusing on influence? And and, and I'll segue that by asking, <clears throat> we know it matters, but why do you feel it's so important? Two great questions. My, my background is in human resources. And if you know anything about human resources, that they tend to be the redheaded stepchild, if you will, of the business world. No one likes HR. And if you look at poor Toby on the office, no one liked Toby. And just HR's portrayal in the media is even just really bad. And honestly, a lot of that is deserved. And as I've gone through my consulting career, and I've realized that HR needs to have much more of an impact on an organization than it does. And of course, that needs to start with the HR people themselves. And so I originally started talking about influence at HR conferences. Folks, you need to step up your game. You should be influencing business decisions, not merely reacting to them. And and that's where it started. And so where it's gone from there is... In working with people and with aspiring leaders to show that regardless of where they're at in their career, where they're at on the company ladder or whatever, that there is a a role that influence has to play. If If we are going to achieve our dreams, whatever they may be personally or professionally, usually we need the help of other people in some way, shape or form. And so in order to get there, then we've got to have some type of relationship, perhaps even influence, not over them, but influence to motivate them, if you will. A lot of people think that influence is about manipulating someone. I'm going to try and influence you to buy a car. Okay. That's selling (laughs) and selling is influence. Absolutely. Right. Buy my car over the other car. We're also talking about influence as a way to inspire people, as a way to Help them to see your vision of how things could be and to hop on the train with you. To me, that's influence. And that's critical for anyone who aspires to lead, not just as a leader of a company, but a leader of a department, a leader of a function. Even a frontline supervisor is a leader, right? We don't need a title. Those are the things that I believe make influence so important. And more importantly, why we need to develop our ability to influence others. That's great. That's very insightful. And for those of you tuning in, or for those of you who are just lurking and haven't said Mm -hmm. hi yet on the Career Coffee Chat show, or if you're watching the podcast later, please do let me know, what does influence mean to you? Mm -hmm. Because influence means all different things for everyone. And you had a great analogy earlier. No, it's manipulation. Buy my car. Not really. We feel that influence has some sort of downward force on another persona when it actually that's reversed and it has more of an upward force and what do i mean by that the best influencers i know are typically those people who have an elevated no trust factor don't you Mm -hmm. think ed yep absolutely right and when i've done work in cultures and as a coach what i find is you can be a very poignant influencer and not have a title at all Mm -hmm. Absolutely. People really want to know three things. 
But before you can influence them, they want to know if you care about them, first and mm-hmm. foremost. If it's obvious you don't care, then you are going to have no, I don't want to keep using the term influence and certainly not power, but you're, you're not going to have the ability to sway their minds if right. you don't show that you care. The next thing they want to know after that is, can you help them? So once they know that you care, then they want to know what's in it for them. It's the the quintessential human experience. What can you do for me? And there's nothing wrong with that. We all need mentors and we need folks around us who are willing to pull us along and share their wisdom. And then finally, the folks need to know from us, can I trust you? So Mm -hmm. you care about me. Can you help me? Can I trust you? If you can nail those three things, now you're on your way to being able to use influence with someone to help them grow. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you can do that at any level. And that's Mm -hmm. why I shared when I introduced the show. It doesn't matter where you are in your career or life. Now, I want to say hi to you just tuning Mm -hmm. in from Germany. She's listening attentively. She said, Hey, Germany. (laughs) (laughs) She will be coming up on the Career Coffee Chat show in a couple months to share with us about remote work environments, how to thrive. And I want to say hi to Jesse, who says leadership to him, influence, uh, sorry, influence to him seems to be a measure of leadership. Mm -hmm. People follow even without an act of control or lack of better word. So, yeah, it's not really about control. It's not. I'll give you an analogy again. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a little story. So the most influential person in our one of a very one of the influential people in our little small community out here in Fayetteville, Texas, outside of Houston, Mm -hmm. Texas, until very recently, he did pass, Mm -hmm. has been a person who owned a grass cutting company. Mm -hmm. He cut grass for a living. That's right. That's what he did. He's done. Yep. Very influential. Why does someone who mows lawns have such influence over the community? Mm -hmm. Because of his giving without reserve persona. Mm -hmm. So he ticked the box on the I care about you. Mm -hmm. What's in it for me? He was always giving to people. And when, by the way, people feel like they're in debt, they Mm -hmm. may not think of it in that term, but they feel like they are indebted to you. Then that gives you the power of reciprocity. There's a, exactly. really, there's a lot of power in the power of reciprocity. So people feel like they need to pay mm-hmm. off that debt. So let's say you right. mow their grass for free a couple of times, <laughs> which I do for my neighbor. Yeah, and he's sure. trying to pay me for a cabinet that I'm like, I'll give it to you. So, no, I absolutely will not. <laughs> free. I have to pay you. I was like, I don't understand. But it's the law of reciprocity. And then, of course, you have the trust factor. And through those things and being a trustworthy person, following up on what you say, so that's my little story. Yeah. And but Jesse's on to something. You've all probably heard of John Maxwell. He's wrote, written just a couple of books about leadership. One or two. <laughs> he, he actually has a quote that that really, it, it encapsulates what we're talking about here. And to Jesse's point, he says, leadership is influence, nothing more and nothing less. And so the real challenge is if, if we don't have influence, we, we really can't be a leader. Now, you can be a leader in title without influence, absolutely. Mm -hmm. We call that positional leadership, and that comes when you get that promotion at work, and you're now director of marketing. Okay, people are like, well, okay, so I got to report to this gal, and I'll see what's up. And then it goes back to those three things. I'm going to wait and see if she cares about me. I'm going to wait and see if she can help me, and then I'll figure out if I can trust her. So that positional leadership only buys us a little bit of time. Before we can convert that into some level of trust and some level of true influence over our people. And so, you know, when we think about it that way, yeah, I I can't, I probably can't get followers if I don't have influence over anybody. And if I don't have followers, I'm certainly not a leader. I'm just a one man band. Taking a walk. (laughs) Yeah, I'm not taking a walk. Exactly. And, And so to me, even in your personal life, I think that our listeners today can probably identify with this. Think about how you spend your personal time. Maybe you've got families, hopefully your spouse or your your children, if you have them, consider you to be a leader in your home. Okay. Maybe you volunteer with scouting organization or a team coach or a band leader, those kinds of things. And you start to think about the influence that you have over some of these kids. 
Okay. And, and people will say, oh, but I'm just volunteering it. Yeah, but you're giving back. And if you're doing it for truly the giving back and not for some self-serving, oh, my company says I got to be on a board, so I'm going to hop on this board kind of thing. If you're really doing it to give back to your community, give back in this case, in my example, to kids, your influence is immeasurable. It really is because who knows where those kids are going to end up, right? You may lose track of them in 30 years from now. They're going to be running a company, running our country. Who knows? Solving cancer, whatever it happens to be. And we don't always know those that we have influence over how that influence is going to play out. And that's the, I think that's the awesome power of it. But it's also the thing that can get us in trouble with influence. Influence can be used for bad. Think about someone who may check some of those boxes, okay, that they care about me and they're going to help me and I think I can trust them, okay? So all that means is now I'm in their inner circle, okay? But we've had leaders across history that have been highly influential people and did despicably evil things. When you think about Hitler, people will say, hey, you know, no, he didn't care about anyone. He cared about his inner circle. His tight group, he cared about. He helped them in terms of power and money and stature, and they did trust him, okay? Say what you want about the guy as bad as he was. He checked those boxes. So he had influence over millions, right? But what did he use it for? So let's not forget that the influence in and of itself is only good if it's used to help mentor people right. and multiply other leaders. That, that's the key, Right. A dictator does not multiply other leaders. They actively keep people in check. Good question yeah. here. Is that the distinction between influence and, and manipulation? A absolutely. You bring absolutely. up a good point. People will say, oh, Adolf Hitler, bad guy. Yeah, horrible. Yes. Horrific. I, there isn't really even words for it. It's that traumatic. Hmm. And yeah, I, yeah. I mean, he, he like, actually, when you look at his leadership model, while for the wrong reasons in, in mm -hmm. keying in on people's need for greed, control, power, and fear. And that's where I'd love to go later on in our conversation. Maybe mm -hmm. it's a difference between abundance mindset and fear and scarcity mm -hmm. mindsets when it comes yeah. to influence. Yeah. yeah. Uh, to answer the, the question. Absolutely. So there are lots of types of influence and, and certainly manipulating is a, is an, way to influence someone to get them to act. Remember, influence is getting someone to act mm. in a way that we would like them to act. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we can think uh, of things like intimidation, right? That's a form of influence. Persuasion, your typical salesman persuading you to buy, you know, X gadget. Okay. Or there are lots right? of different you're ways, right? Right. right? Yeah. But until you don't we do get, this, you might die. That kind of yeah, thing. Exactly. So <laughs> until we get to the respect Peace. That's where true influence for leadership sake happens. Yeah, let's let's not forget that influence can be used for bad, and I don't certainly preach that. That's not not why I think we. That's we more need manipulation. I think yeah. you're onto something. That's really more manipulation. And we're going to think about influence in its purest form. Mm -hmm. We're thinking about harm to none, altruistic reasons, giving, giving and helping mentality. What I call pay it forward mentality, mm -hmm. and and by so doing and in basically practicing what you preach, showing up, if you commit to something, you've committed to it, being a right. transparent, honest person, your credibility then builds the trust. Of course, the more they, they get to know you, that's the no factor. Mm -hmm. And then the caring factor is the fact that you're a pay it forward person and you're, exactly. you're there to help people within your boundaries. So mm -hmm. here's the thing. Yeah. A lot of people get off the bus. They're like, oh, OK, all I do is just give to others. So I'm just going to give. Yeah. <laughs> you have to make sure not to, to get off topic. Giving is good. Okay. Obviously giving is good, but we all have an emotional tank that needs filled. Leaders can burn out. It's great to be a servant leader. I believe in that trait. However, the relationships have to be also fulfilling for us. So if we have surrounded ourselves with takers who are constantly sucking our energy out, Simply because of what we can do for them, mm -hmm. that's clearly not a healthy relationship. And, and I'd argue from a business perspective, you're not truly leading them. They're using you. And so we all know those types of people who it just they are drained to be around because they're sucking the life force out of us. 
Okay. And, and I think that from a self-care standpoint, we've got to be cognizant of that. Mm-hmm. And as a leader, having those healthy boundaries, and establishing mm-hmm. expectations. Okay. Here's the boundary. This is the allowable like interaction interface, what you can expect from me, et cetera. And yep. at, at any level, honestly, I don't, I, when people come to me, they're looking to elevate. If they're already a leader or they're looking to move up in the new organization or think about merging into leadership. And it's a big challenge for them to understand, okay, how do I set boundaries? And what does that look like for me? And am I being strategic about what I say yes to? Because when you say yes to one thing, you say no to something else. Absolutely. And a big mistake I see of some people who are interested in climbing the ladder, if you will, they say yes to everything because they think, oh, I'll give me visibility. Well, visibility if done incorrectly, may give you influence, but may not be the kind of influence you want. Right. Right. <laughs> it hurts your brand because you're known as a person who can't complete, <clears throat> who can't finish things, can't that credibility factor su- suffers. Yeah. And it's hard, especially if, if we've got some entrepreneurs listening in, saying no is hard. And it doesn't get any easier. I've been doing this consulting thing now for 20 years and saying no doesn't get easier because as, as I say no now, there's usually more zeros involved than there was 20 years ago. And it, it's hard to stay focused on the goal. And I know we're getting off the influence thing, but yeah, you've got to be able to, in order to stay true to yourself and all leader, and actually here's how I want to tie it back in, all influence, all leadership starts with how we lead ourselves. And so we can't lead others. It's like the old saying, you can't love someone else till you, till, till you love yourself properly. You can't lead others until you lead yourself. And people say, well, Ed, what does that even mean? And I say, think about it this way. So let's say, Aaron, that you promise to do something for me and you don't do it timely. You let me down. Okay. I probably hold you to a stand and say, well, she let me down. And I can't believe she let me down. Doggone it. And, and I don't want to listen to any excuse in the book. But if I let you down and I say to myself, life got busy and I just didn't have time to get to it. And I let myself off the hook. You see, I'm holding you to a different standard than I hold myself. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's what I'm talking about with self-leadership. How do we hold ourselves accountable for the behaviors we want to exhibit to be a leader and, and to hold ourselves to the things that we promise to others? Mm-hmm. Okay. That's huge. And um, like, I am very disappointed. So for those of you that are listening, Aaron reminded me that I let her down. I promised her a referral um, <laughs> to, to a service provider and I let her down and she got the pouty face. And honestly, Aaron, I do. I, I, like to me, that's just, it's not cool. We talked about it. I forgot. Now it's written down so I won't forget. But, th- but that's where to me, I, I take that seriously because all we have at the end of the day to offer other folks is our words and our and backed up by our actions. Mm. And so if, if we can't follow up our words and actions, forget influence, forget leadership, re- really Absolutely. forget any of that. You're never going to build trust. And I'll caveat that and saying that doesn't mean you can't be human. Mm-hmm. It It's all about how you show up. Yeah. If you show up truth and authentically say, gosh, I, I screwed up. I, I feel terrible. I totally forgot or whatever it was. Unless you continually do this, probably a one-off instant is not going to Mm -hmm. cancel your ability to be a leader. (laughs) No, I would agree. Yeah, we are all human. We all make mistakes. Too many leaders feel like, oh, I can't be a leader. I can't have Mm -hmm. influence unless I'm perfect. No, you've got to be authentic. (laughs) Got to be authentic. And I, I was having a discussion with someone the other day about leading in a crisis. And they asked me, and I didn't want to go down the political road with the example, but they asked, what about the political leadership that we've had during the pandemic? And I said, if you take out, forget left, any of that stuff, and just look at it from a leadership perspective, what do we want out of our leaders, political, religious, faith-based, whoever? We want to trust them. We want to know if they actually care about us. And we want to know what they're going to do for us, right? Now, those three things that we've talked about already, here are the challenges with that on a massive scale. So you can only be a model to the masses. You can only model the right behaviors. 
to influence, you've got to influence on an individual level. So if we're thinking that our politicians or our faith leaders or whatever are going to in, be able to be influential because of their position, go back to what we talked about with positional leadership. It's, it's only as good as what have you done for me lately? OK, and so we've got to build the building blocks with individuals before we can influence the masses and get to that 15,000 people that we were going to influence in our lifetime. And so those individual connections cannot be um, underestimated. Absolutely. And, and, and that's where we're at in society today is with a lot of our public figures. We, we don't know if we can trust them. We don't know if we can trust talking heads. We don't know. And it shouldn't be a surprise to us. Again, I'm not making a political statement one side or the other. I'm just saying in general, this should not be a surprise because trust happens on an individual level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're right. Yes, it does. Absolutely. And for those people who might be tuning in or listening later or listening to the podcast, let's just say I'm a very reserved person, mm -hmm. very introverted. I don't really, I cannot stand networking events. Don't even ask me about that. I'm pretty quiet. I do my work. I'm diligent. Few people know me, but I'm not like a social butterfly by any stretch. I don't feel like I have influence. Is that true? Mm, not true. Not true. I am an introvert. I'm not a raging introvert. I'm not a wallflower. But folks need to remember what it means to be an extrovert ver versus an introvert. And it's where you get your energy from. I can have these sorts of chats. It doesn't suck energy out of me. I do a lot of public speaking at conferences. And when I step off that stage, I'm drained because I'm giving so much energy. Okay. That's the sign of an introvert. Like you, I would prefer as much as I can talk to people and I'm pretty at ease. I don't like to go to networking events either, unless I know I'm going to know somebody there. But, and again, that's the mark of an introvert. And so that doesn't mean you can't be influential. And it certainly doesn't mean that you can't be a leader. We're starting to see some pretty good research come out that maybe introverts make better leaders. Why? Because we're a little right. more introspective. We're a little bit more, I hate to say reserved, but reserved in our thinking. We like to reflect on things. We like to take in. We like to listen. We like to observe. We're good people watchers. And so there's something to be said for that. And influence doesn't happen just because of your words, right? It's your actions. So that that quiet and shy person over in the corner, really, we should be watching what they're doing, not necessarily what they're saying. And that's where you get those informal influencers. We've got folks that are listening that, that have people responsibilities in their workplaces. Look for those. We call those peer level influencers. Who are the folks that seem that other people seem to look at and watch? And again, doesn't have to be, you know, a shift leader, doesn't have to be a, a union shop steward or anything like that. It's just someone that they watch and, and wherever that person goes, they go. OK, those are the types of people who have influence. Right. And in my experience, some of those folks are not the most outspoken. In fact, sometimes they're the, they're the quietest people, but they, they do their job in a way that exudes a confidence and an aura about them that people say, I need to pay attention to that person over there. Absolutely. You know, it, when, if you identify with being more reserved and I'm an ambivert, depends on the day, whether I get trained or not, <laughs> but I'm like you and some, sometimes I can walk away from a speaking event. I'm like, yeah, sometimes mm -hmm. I'm like, I need a nap. So <laughs> I'm right in the middle. Yeah, but yeah. If you identify with being more reserved, it, it has no bearing on your ability to influence others. Absolutely none. None. In fact, it's highly more likely that you develop deeper, more meaningful relationships. It's true. The only consideration you might want to think about is to break down your barriers, if you have any, between mm -hmm. developing broader ties and being more comfortable with developing broader ties and allowing yourself that space and grace. Right. Because we don't want to just rely on just a few people. We want other people to know us. Mm -hmm. So. Think about what's comfortable for you as far as expanding that influence. Yeah. And maybe you like to write, you want to write blogs, thought 
leadership pieces in your industry or whatever that looks like, that is also influential, mm -hmm. particularly if you're doing it from a help focus. I am helping adding value, a value exactly. focus perspective, because I know that actually helped me land several leadership positions in my corporate career yeah. because I became more known in that space. So uh, you actually have another piece of wonderful wisdom here. Let's see mm -hmm. if I can encapsulate this correctly. She said, reflecting on leaders that influenced me in my career when I was an employee in the corporate world were actually leaders who probably didn't intentionally do things to influence me. So they weren't intentional. They, oh, let me go out here and influence you. And yeah. um, they did things that resonated with me and my values. And I think that's what made an impact on me. And so they therefore influenced me. Does that make sense? It, 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 that's a, it's an awesome statement because a person's influence comes from their ability to add value to another person. So clearly what, what we're hearing is that your listener had a lot of opportunity to interact with leaders who added value back. Mm -hmm. And that's the key, right? Is that adding value back to others. We Again, it goes back to that who's sucking the life out of you and who's refilling your tank up. And we all have those people that we walk away from going, Gosh, they're a great person. I just, I feel so good when I'm around them. There's an, a value add there. Mm -hmm. And the value add can be, how do you make me feel? How are you helping me develop? How are you helping me solve a problem? Are you just making me smile when I need a smile? That's right. So adding value can mean a lot of different things based on the scenario and the lens through which that recipient of the value needs it at any point in time. And yeah, I don't think that, I think one of the questions we have to ask ourselves as leaders really is, why do I want to be an influencer? Like, well, what's my end game here? Mm -hmm. Because if you can answer that, now you can decide what's the path you need to take with your influence. If it's world domination, okay, that's a whole different path than you know what, I'm trying to build a company and I want to influence people because I want them to see the vision that I have for this company. I want them to be a part of it. I want them to be fired up so that I have the best talent working for me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Those are two different paths. Both are attainable, but it's going to take different types of value adding, okay, to make right. it happen. And so when I think about the, the clients that I've worked with that have done it well, the, their workplace culture and the environment was one of I'm going to challenge you and I'm going to hold you accountable, but I'm also going to give you all the tools you need to be successful and not just physical tools and not just budgets, but the resource of, of my time as a leader and a mentor or the resource of being in that network group or that referral group or getting you a really good executive coach, whatever it happens to be. Those are the things that, those are the ties that bind. When you're talking about getting people behind you and in a shared vision and truly adding value to them. Yeah. And I think what we're seeing today is as companies are wrestling with what do we want to do with bringing people back to the office right now? OK, mm. and it disappoints me that so many companies are, are going with this all or nothing approach. You just had people work at home and be productive for 18 months. And now you're going to tell them, oh, well, that's no good. You got to come back. OK. And that's why we're seeing the great resignation. And, and so what's happening is the message that we're sending is we don't trust you. We trusted you when we had to. But now that we don't have to trust you, we're not going to trust you anymore. Conditional trust. And, and, and it's a shame because I'm working with the, one company that's coming to mind right now. And the, the chief executive, great guy, love his vision, love the way he's fired up his workforce. But he's making some decisions now that are going to have massive negative impacts on the culture unless we can get them reversed. And that's just one of them. That's just one of the examples that's fresh mm -hmm. in my mind. The leaders I'm, I coach, we're seeing massive attrition, particularly mm -hmm. around workplaces that demand, oh, now you have to be. It was OK for a while. We put up with it. But now you have to be in the mm -hmm. office. And people are like, no, I did this job just fine in their yeah. minds. Uh for a year yeah. <laughs> or more. And now you want me to change? Some people are quitting without having another opportunity yeah. here yeah. in the US. So we're seeing what's called the great resignation. And a lot of that is because of these decisions yeah. that leaders are making. Yeah. One of the last live speaking gigs I did before the lockdown started, I was down in Louisiana at their state Sherm conference. 
And we were talking about HR strategy. And one of the pieces that we got to talking about was uh, this idea of telework and remote work. And you know, I, I recall one of the ladies in the front row, she raised her hand. She said, Ed, I will never support remote work. And I said, why not? I bet she's changed her tune now. But <laughs> I said, why not? I mean, she says, because I don't know if those people are actually working. And I said, okay, so I'm going to take, I'm always up for a good challenge. I'm a bit of an instigator. My wife will tell you that. But so I said, okay, so let's delve into this for a moment. So in HR, do you handle the hiring? She says, yes. I said, do you have final say? She goes, yes, with the hiring manager that we both decide. I said, okay. Mm -hmm. So what you're telling me then is that you have intentionally hired people that you can't trust to do the job. And a hush falls over the crowd. She had no response. And that, that's my challenge for HR. It's circling back to you asking me about, about where I start with influence. To me, that's a horribly short-sighted piece. Now, that was two years ago. I'd love to, to track that lady down now. Maybe I need to go back to the video and, and see if I can find out who she is uh, and say, hey, what are, you, what are you thinking these days? I've worked remotely for 20 years now. And people say, oh, yeah, but you're a sole prop. So I, I can remember when I started out working from home and I was at a, a networking event out of my, my local town and met another HR consultant. And he told me two things that have stuck with me today and have been driving forces for me. One, now 20 years ago, my hair was still dark brown, okay? And he, he said to me, Ed, you don't have enough of this. And he pointed to his gray hair. Okay, so <laughs> what, what is that supposed to mean? I, I hadn't earned my chops yet or something. But the other thing he said to me was, you're never going to get taken seriously as long as you're working from home. Now, I didn't believe him then. I certainly don't believe him now. But I've carried that chip on my shoulder, right, that – who cares where I've always been a pro who cares where you work from? A am I the best person to help That's a you? Very dated, as yeah. very outmoded, very outdated right. control, fear, and scarcity based yeah. mindset. Yeah. Which brings me to our next part of our show before we wrap mm -hmm. up. But I want to touch base with Gerald's um, insight here because he did okay. pose a really good question for us. Can you take care of your career from home without mm -hmm. some kind of face-to-face -face networking interaction? I propose that you can in balance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Take Dropbox, for example. Now, granted, they're a tech company. They're San Francisco based, and they've gone to the virtual first methodology mm -hmm. and they have redesigned everything. They've, they've thrown out the window offices. So there's no offices for you to come into right. because they know that their people can do great jobs remotely. And they've developed a space for people to touch point. So it's a touch point space. You need to have an in-person meeting. Great. We have a space for that. You need to touch base with somebody one day a week or every, once a month. Great. We have a space for that. But you don't have to be there all the time. And I feel like because our, I've noticed this from a sociological behavioral science standpoint, we really struggle for balance. We really do. It's like, oh, here. Whether it's political, religion, anything, we're like <laughs> extreme central. And I'm not sure why, because <laughs> most answers are found in the balance. Mm -hmm. It's true. It's true. And, and I think, yes, you can. Is it maybe a little more challenging? Perhaps it requires a little bit more effort. However, I, I would also say it could be helpful. And here's why. We all have bad days, Right. If you're having a bad day working from home, who knows? Maybe the dog or your spouse, if they're also working from home. But you can have a bad day and maybe you get away with it. You have a bad day at the office and you upset the wrong person. Just because you're having a bad day, what happens? I think that we always think, oh, well, I'm missing out on the opportunity to build connections and hurrah and go to coffee and talk to the water cooler. Yeah, absolutely. You're also insulating yourself from those times when you're not at your best. And, and I think that that's the positive side of this is that where are you at your best? So if you are at your best in the office and your company is welcoming people back to the office, then get back to the office. If it's some sort of hybrid approach for you, that's what's best for you and your company's willing to do that. Make it happen because I believe that the light is going to shine through. Your light will shine through when you're at your best. So figure out where you're at your best 
and be your best. Mm-hmm. I know there's office politics and there's the shaking of hands and the kissing of babies that needs to happen to get ahead. But the reality is the majority of it is no one's going to care that you shake, shook their hand if your work output is subpar and you don't know how to talk to people even through a Zoom relationship. So right. um, that, that's my two cents on, on that. I and mean, I'm sure we'd find some people that would disagree with us, but I don't, when the pandemic started as a member of the National Speakers Association, all I heard was, oh, live speaking's done. It's never coming around. What are you people smoking? Oh, I, I heard we, the same thing. And it's it's to be on. fair, to be fair, yes. Yes. a lot of people, that's where they, that's where they, their brilliance. They yeah, grew up I, in person and that was their brilliance and they were just devastated. Yeah. And I get it. However, I was also the first person to go, I was contacting my local professional organizations. I used to speak in person. I was okay. We're going virtual. Let's do this. And I was be the guinea pig. And sometimes it didn't go very well because we didn't know what we were doing back in yeah. March. You know? Technology doesn't work, and yeah, <laughs> but we figured it out. And I sure. got them virtual. And it, that's the thing. It's being, it's knowing where you show up the best, being able to manage that, and being agile in the moment. Mm-hmm. It's not a it's not a black and white, all or nothing. It never is black and white, all or nothing answer. No. But So I want to touch on several key points before we wrap up the show, because we've had a great conversation. I've had a lot yeah, of yeah. about you, <laughs> but thank you for all of you tuned in and uh, ask your questions, giving us mm-hmm. your insights. And please don't be shy if you're still waiting out there in the wings, not quite sure if you want to ask your question or not. Thank yeah, you for the DM, either one of us. And just know that also you're welcome to share the replay for this on or the coffee or coffee cat podcast. If you're watching the podcast, please give us a thumbs up or a star rating. We appreciate that. And I want to touch on a couple things, influencing up mm-hmm. and fear and scarcity versus abundance mindsets when it mm-hmm. comes to influence. Yeah. Which one do you want to tackle first? Well, let's do scarcity mindset. All right. <laughs> let's do it. I'm excited. Because I've really been focusing on this lately. And one of the reasons why I love my mother dearly. She has recently moved ne- near to us. And I realized that her structure is based on fear and scarcity. And because i am that's been like shoved in my face again. I was like, now I'm to deal with it. I'm, I'm also showing it to her. And now she's recognizing things. So it's very interesting how that's un- unfolding and how much our society our familiar structures, everything creates an unconscious fear and scarcity bias. Yes. So here's the thing. You can put yourself out there and say, okay, I don't want to help anybody else. I just want to help me. And I want you to think about that mentality because that's the fear and scarcity mentality, mm-hmm. right? I'm going to look out for numero uno. <laughs> um, I'm afraid to share it with anybody else because that's right. I, need, I need this. There's control. no room. Now, if you agree in my statement at the, the top of the show that in order to get anything done, we need others around us. Okay. By pushing others away, we are limiting our potential. And, and I can tell you one of my best referral partners, this woman has given me tens of thousands of dollars of business over the course of our relationship together. She's another HR consultant. Now people say, oh my gosh, Ed, but don't you guys overlap? No. And we recognize that early on. The the things that are in my wheelhouse are not in hers and vice Mm -hmm. versa. And what has become beautiful is I've been able to refer back to her. She's referred to me. Both our practices are growing and thriving and yet on the surface, you would go, huh, you're about 90% the same. Eh, maybe, but that 10% is where the magic is. And so I've never been one to outwardly embrace the, the fear and scarcity. I would be lying if I didn't say the little bird on my shoulder sometimes doesn't chirp in and say, hey, dude, there's not enough to go around. So watch what you're doing. Okay, that, that's there. That little gremlin pops up every now and then. Okay, and I got to smack him and say, look, not only am I blessed in what I've been able to do for people, but I continue to see that the I used to have this mindset of I keep giving, giving and nothing comes back to me. I'm tired of it. 
If you have that mindset, guess what? Exactly. Right. <laughs> and I did. I would, I served on boards and committees and I gave them my time. And I just felt, where's the, you come on universe, hook me up. It wasn't until I really started to spend some time focusing every day on the things that I was grateful for. Did I realize, wait a minute, the universe is hooking you up pretty good here, pal. Okay. And so in order to be able to be influential for others and to care about others, we need to take a step back and say, okay, what do we have to be grateful for? What is going really well for us right now? Okay. And once you realize that the things that are going well for you probably had something to do with someone else's involvement in your life, you start to realize that you need other people. And the more other quality people you can surround yourself with, the better off you are going to be, regardless of the stage of your your life, your career, or whatever. So yeah, do I struggle with that mentality every now and then? Absolutely. I think it'd be, be almost inhuman not to. But I go back to my gratitude exercise and really being focused on, okay, I, I just landed a big client. Yay. Where did that come from? Oh, someone knew someone who said, got to talk to him. Circles I mean, back to influence. Yeah. It goes back to a value driven first mentality. Mm -hmm. you know, can I give value and can I do so from a space of abundance? Because I also have one closing story. Young lady I know, she influenced others because it came from a fear and scarcity perspective mm -hmm. because she didn't feel like she had enough or she wanted more and had to be this mm -hmm. had to be reciprocal it wasn't just happenstance because that's the way right. it is it had to be reciprocal and she would for example she gave someone a piece of jewelry once just hoping that they would back they her up back. <laughs> this movement she was going to do and this, this process she was going to propose okay. or whatever and yeah so it 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 imploded <laughs> badly. <laughs> and now she's shifted gears and she's changed to doing a lot of deep work, but okay. she had to realize that because she was approaching it from a fear and scarcity mindset, that she was per creating more fear and scarcity. Mm -hmm. You approach it from abundance mindset, a gratitude mindset. That's where true, beautiful influence happens because you're not sabotaging yourself. Mm -hmm. And please don't be too hard on yourself because we are very programmed from childhood to be this fear and scarcity model. Mm -hmm. And it will take some work, unlearning and relearning. I know I'm doing it right now. It's a process. Yeah. <laughs> it's a process. But it's so rewarding because it's interesting. We focus so much time on what we don't want. And really, we need to be focusing on what we do Great. want in this life and our careers or what have you. So, Ed, it's been a deep pleasure having you on the show. Yeah, this has been a lot of fun. And I know that it's been a lot of fun having all of you tune in, ask your questions, give us your insights. Thank you so much for your participation. We love having you on the show. And for those of you watching the replay or listening to the podcast later, don't be shy. Reach out. If you have questions, feel free to reach out to either one of us. Absolutely. Ed has some great materials here I would like to share with you. You can find out more about him at edcrow.com. Mm -hmm. And, of course, look in the show notes. He's also got a discounted um, access to his book, which is highly worthwhile. I recommend you checking that out as well. So, again, Ed, it's been a deep pleasure. Thank you for being on the show. Thank all of you for tuning in. And until next time, my friends, keep elevating. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you for tuning in on the Career Coffee Chat podcast. It's been a pleasure. Feel free to reach out to me. My email is coacheurban at gmail.com or tweet at coacheurban, Instagram coach.eurban, or reach out to my Facebook group, Elevate Your Career. So I'd love to learn more about you, hear your insights, and what questions you have. You can find out more about me at coacheurban.com. And don't forget, please do reach out on LinkedIn. You can find me at Aaron Urban. Until next time, cheers. Here's to caffeinating your career.